All right, we are live. We are so sorry for the delay. Um, Rachel has a fantastic doggy that she had to make sure got taken care of. Uh, her doggy was acting kind of weird. And as you all know, I am 100% a dog lover and doggos come first. Doggos before whiskey, always, forever. Um, so, that said, uh, <laughs> let's welcome my friend, Ms. Rachel Potts. If you guys have been watching this channel for a while, or my YouTube content, or rather just my booze content over the last, you know, year and a half or so, you'll remember that I did an episode on Ben Riek with Rachel's San Francisco counterpart, the fantastic Scotch Mr. Rory Glasgow. Uh, and today we're talking Glen Glossa, which means Valley of the Gray Green or Valley of the Green Gray. It's a very weird translation, but uh, Glen Glossa is a brand that doesn't get a lot of attention, actually, I feel like, despite having some very tasty malts. Mm -hmm. um, so let's dive into it. Rachel, why don't you just tell us a little about yourself before we kind of get started here, because you've never been on this channel before. No, this is my first time. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm Rachel Potts. I'm the brand ambassador for the lovely single malts, uh, Ben Riek, Glendronic, and of course, Glenglasa, which we're tasting today. I've lived in LA now for about 13 years, bartended, bar managed a number of places, and kind of fell in love with whiskey. And then fortunately, was able to work for some of the favorite whiskeys I got to taste throughout the years. So it's really my dream job. I couldn't ask for a better, uh, <laughs> a better uh, livelihood. So. Great. In two seconds here, I just realized I needed to update something. No problem. Um, hit me up on social media, you guys. Instagram, and now after months of pestering, I have marketing, I have blog, I have a TikTok. Uh, I have one, <laughs> one video. Um, and we'll see what happens, but uh, after months of pestering, I have a TikTok, so the same on my Instagram, hit me up there, and thanks as always for watching, remember to like, subscribe, and ring the bell, smack that bell like the bartender smacking uh, their notification, their, uh, notification, like their shaker tins. Um, so, also quick hello to our friend Joe Van Name, who's in the chat. Joe, hello. Uh, you're in Austin right now, right, Joe, hosting Whiskey Marketing? Uh, he is in Texas from Virginia, and he is hosting some whiskey education at the Austin Whiskey Vault. Uh, so I've been sipping on a little bit of Torfa before we started just because I wanted a little bit of peat. But uh, why don't you talk to us about Glen Glassa, Rachel? Sure. So you mentioned that it's a lesser known distillery that doesn't get a ton of love. Um, Glen Glassa actually has a very unique history. It was actually started in 1875, but it's been pretty much mothballed longer than it was ever in production. So, you know, we've been fortunate enough to have this distillery at our fingertips that has this long line of producing fantastic whiskeys, but now is reawakened, which allows us to do some really unique things. Um, Glasso at the time was owned by a couple different brands. So it was founded by uh, John Moore in 1875, who through some family tragedies, unfortunately was no longer able to sustain the distillery. Um, he actually started the distillery because he was a grocer and was really successful being uh, starting this grocery markets all throughout Port Soy, uh, which is near where we're located. That's how uh, Johnny Walker got started, the John Walker whiskeys. John Walker was a grocer and he decided to start, you know, making his, or not making, but blending his own whiskeys and selling them. And it's a very similar thing in this case. So, you know, people at the time were really demanding whiskeys. There's this amazing whiskey boom going on at the time and John Morris decided why not make my own whiskey to really help my business. Um, he found this amazing place in Sandown Bay. So for anyone that knows a little bit of geography with Scotland, uh, Glasgow is in this very unique uh, geological map point. So we're right on the border of Speyside and Highland, but we're also right on the coast. So I can actually show you if anyone has a bottle arrival at home, you can actually see the amazing Sand and Bay right there, which is where our distillery is located. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know who that was. So we're very coastal, but still in that amazing Speyside Highland region. Um, so because of that, we get to produce a really unique whiskey. And it really becomes evident throughout the time of where it was, Gungasa was owned and who it was owned by, 
why it is so unique. So after um, John Moore then sold it to Highland Distillers, which a lot of people know um, produced some fantastic whiskeys or did at the time. And they really want to try to use this in their blends. You know, at the time it was very popular for a lot of these bigger companies to buy these smaller distilleries and use this whiskey in their different types of blends. But throughout the years, they really found that Glen Glassow is just so vibrant. It really is not one that was easy to find that balance with the brand because it always stood out. This is kind of the kid in class who's in the school play that was always the one that you spotted on the stage <laughs> and was always the loudest one kind of acting in the best role and it just would not be part of a chorus but wanted to be a standout uh, whiskey. So due to not really being able to figure out how to use this in blends or just not really having the right format for that, um, it was mothballed for a long period of time until uh, Ben React Distilling came along and sort of revamped it and started bottling it under its own name. But that's actually where, if we wanted to already start tasting, I don't know how interested you are in tasting it, Sam. I know you already got the Torfa cracked. Let's go. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm going to start with the Revival here. Cool. Let me switch these around. And also a big thank you to you, Rachel, for providing us the whiskey for us to taste along with you today. Absolutely. So, you know, Revival. it's been a hot minute actually since I've had any Glen Glassa. Uh, I want to say close to three years. Oh, nice. So this is kind of like you rediscovering it as well. <laughs> yeah. So we're starting with the Revival here. So Revival was the very first uh, sort of re-release Ever since mm. the I was reawakened. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be. Now these are all non-age statements. They are a little bit younger than ten years. Again, we only started production again in about two thousand nine. So it doesn't give you a lot of that longevity or time to let it sit in the cast for a while. So we wanted to really make a showing of what our amazing spirit is. And the younger the spirit is, you actually get more of that amazing still quality to that. Absolutely, it's less of the barrel influence. It's more of the actual distill shining through. And what I'm going to love is as we taste through all three of these, you're going to see that vibrancy I kind of talked about a little bit in these blends standing out. You know, Gungasa was in a very unique, I mentioned geographical location, but we're also sourcing a water source that is the highest mineral content in Scotland, which also produces this amazing, great, great, fruity, sweet, raw spirit. And even on the nose here, you can just really discover that. Absolutely. No, it's like very very buttery actually and like kind of like fluffy pancakes it, tons of fluffy pancakes maybe but i definitely get some strawberries on there too a little bit of pineapple too some tropical fruits on there i definitely I mean, can see pineapple but i don't see strawberry well maybe you'll get I remind you of fluffy blueberry pancakes or blueberries are great like ripe summer fruits are really prominent here and now this is aged in three different casks so this is aged in ex bourbon cask is aged in red wine barrels, and then it's also aged in X sherry. So we're getting a lot of interesting complexity just yeah. in that. So on the nose here, you mentioned that butteriness, I'm definitely getting that from the X bourbon. I'm getting nuttiness as well, and a little bit of citrus from that sherry. And then again, that kind of ripe summer fruit for the red wine. And then on the palate, it's really interesting to see how this really transforms. The palate actually is very similar to the nose for me until the end when it drops off and turns bitter. So you do get some amazing sort of finish on here with that sherry, that very old oak, Spanish oak sherry cask is going to give it this amazing sort of almost like the dried kind of cinnamon, the unsweetened dried cinnamon type finish at the very end. Um, which might be a little bit that kind of that bitterness you're talking about with that amazing oak influence I get on the finish. But the beginning of the palate, I get that amazing nuttiness that we talked about, the butteriness. This is definitely a whiskey for being so young that has so much character and body. So what is it, like six years old? So this is going to be most likely around seven to eight years old. But again, under 10, so that means you could have some barrels a little bit older, some barrels a little bit younger. It just all depends on Dr. Rachel Berry figuring out which one creates the perfect combination, which is what's in our glass here. Dr. And Berry is fantastic, and we will get to her actually later on in the uh, stream. We will discuss Dr. Berry, um, but I have the utmost respect for that woman. Her palate, her brain is just fantastic. I've had the pleasure of meeting her on a couple of occasions. She's always a gem. 
Now, something unique about this too, Sam, and something you're gonna find very prominently throughout the next few expressions is there's also a very interesting note of sea salt and salinity in these. Interesting. Now, normally I'm the first to pick up salinity and I didn't get it. So especially when you start thinking about caramel, with this, we talked about that butteriness. I also get kind of a salted caramel in here. So it is a very unique process in the fact that, and it, this is honestly too, so I, I, as you know, and as we stated, I am the brand ambassador for Glendronic and Ben Riach as well. I find that, you know, Ben Riach is that amazing, clean, and still kind of eccentric space side that's doing some creative things, but still has that great space side backbone. Glendronic has that old school way of making Highland single malt, sherried, uh, matured scotches. Glen Glass now is one that is so unique to me that every time I pick up a glass, I always get something different. This is the single malt scotch I love to give for somebody who's tried everything and wants to try something completely different. Because I could never really put this in its own category. It really does just encapsulate this uniqueness to it and this vibrancy. I can see that. Now, here's a question that everyone asks all the time. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this briefly yesterday, pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, so that's probably the hardest part of the job is Scottish Gaelic, because I can barely uh, <laughs> handle everything else. But uh, Gunglass, ah. So I kind of think of Gunglass, ha. Ah. It's like a breath of fresh air. <laughs> so Glenglass. Ah. Yes. Gotcha. So for those of you guys listening and watching at home, uh, the A U G H the is the uh, so it's Glen Glass, uh, like Glen Glass, ugh, Glen Glass, uh, like ugh. It's not ow. It's not Glen Glass, ugh. It's Glen Glass, uh. Now I mentioned it earlier briefly. It's Valley of the Green Gray or something along those lines, right? It is. It is the way that Dr. Rachel Berry likes to describe it, though. It's really sort of the Valley of the Sea. You know, we are in this valley, we get these amazing barley fields that surround us. It's part of the reason why the distillery location was chosen is because it's access to this great barley field. And again, it is right in the border um, in Highland near Speyside, but we have that amazing coastal kind of view. So that green gray is really what it looks like at the distillery all the time. It's that beautiful Scottish coastline that you get to see. Um, uh, I can't wait to visit in April. Oh, that's so exciting. I April 2021, I'm going across to Speyside and I'm probably going to take a week in Scotland and just, you know, hit everywhere I can. I've honestly heard that Gunglass is one of those magical places to visit just because of the pure beauty of that oceanside seascape and also, again, the amazing whiskeys. So I mentioned that, you know, we have been mothballed for over 20 years. We've our warehouses have been chock full of some amazing single malt scotches that entire yeah. time. Yeah, so talking about the mothballing, mm -hmm. uh, so there was the first owner whose name I'm blanking on right now. John Moore. And then they, yes, John Moore, you said? Yep. So John Moore, he founded it when? 1875. And when did he have to close it? So he didn't. Close it. He did sell it basically. So there's a tragedy where unfortunately he and his nephew both passed um, and the family, instead of trying to maintain it, sold it to Highland Distilling. Um, it was then closed for a bit of time in the 1960s while they revamped the equipment and started trying to really uh, ramp it, update everything that they could for it. And then it reopened again uh, in the early 18, or sorry, 1970s. Um, again, it just was not. So I'm just not following this timeline right now. Established in 1875. When did they pass away? They passed away right at the tail end of the 1800s, early 1900s. So it was. So I live distillers and bought it. Let's say they bought it in like 1910 or whatever. Yeah, they bought it in the very early um, 1900s. They kept it open for 50 years, then they closed it? So they kept it, again, it was operational but it wasn't really producing a lot it wasn't really something they were focused on they used it once in a while they used it for the warehouses but it wasn't producing the type of whiskey so it was definitely mothballed off and on throughout that time in the 1960s gotcha. 
in the 1960s, what they did was they decided to really try to increase the capacity of what they could produce. So in 1960, they closed it for very for a little bit of time to get everything back up and running, um, reopened it again, but had the same problem. Just this single malt was so vibrant for these blends. It just was not able to be used as much. So then it closed. Uh, and then for about 20 years, it sat not in operation, but with their warehouses still full of whiskey. And it was finally opening up for production about 2009. So from about 1980-ish, 1990, to about 2009, it was completely shut down. Wow. And that's how you have this, like, Glen Gloss of 50-year-old, something that just came out, right? We actually are very lucky. So the distillery was at one point broken into, actually, quite a few times. Um, <laughs> however, the thieves did not touch the whiskey. They just took the copper that was being used in the equipment. So while that, that was really stupid to me. Hey, I mean, lucky for us, they were not the smartest thieves. <laughs> now we still have some amazing whiskeys dating back to the 1960s, 1970s, still sitting in our warehouses. Wow. And my big question, and this is going to be an annoying one. Why do I not have any cask strength in Glossa? Why is there no cask strength release in the core expression? Why do we have to go to single cask to get a cask strength release? So again, Glen Glassow is a smaller distillery. We're not producing a ton. So just to put it in some perspective, a lot of the bigger brands and bigger distilleries are producing anywhere up to 16 million liters a year. You know, Glen Johnic produces about 1.4, Ben Rioch about 1.9, 2. Glen Glassow only produces 800,000. We are doing such a small percentage. So what we're doing and really focusing on is the amazing sort of consistency with our core range. And that's not to say there's nothing exciting coming down the pipeline. There are going to be some very exciting things coming down the pipeline, but we are a newly reawakened distillery. So our focus right now is to really show off this core range. That being said, sorry, I'm on a busy street. <laughs> that being said, we have some amazing single casts that are out there on the market. So we have some great options out there for you to cut and find. There is an amazing uh, port single cask that I have currently on my shelf. There's amazing Pedro Jimenez sherry barrel. So we're really also fine tuning what Dr. Rachel Berry does best with her barrel selection. So anything that is super special when it comes to one-off sort of, this is a very unique barrel that needs to shine on its own. We have some amazing bottles out there that are cast strength, single cask, beauties. Um, in terms of having just a cast strength release, you know, these are higher proof. We are at least giving you some cast consistency, but at the moment we're focusing on these three cores for the master, for the bigger production. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's just a disappointing answer. <laughs> <laughs> again, I can't say what's coming down the pipeline. It's all up to Dr. Rachel Berry. Um, and again, those amazing one-off single casts are just phenomenal. Well, where can I find one in LA then? I want to try one. Uh, so I can actually message you a few places that are fantastic that I can send to you. So appreciate that. That'd be amazing. I've, you know, I'm always looking to try fun single cask scotches. Um, so we're using what kind of red, going back to the actual bottles, we got yes. sidetracked here. What kind of red wine are we is being used in the revival blend? So again, a little bit of that is proprietary. So we unfortunately do not have the specific red wine that we're using in this. Um, it could be a mix of a few different types of varietals where they were sourced from, but this is gonna be sort of a brighter uh, red wine cast versus a port versus the sherry. Um, the sherry we're using here, definitely I feel like it's Oloroso. Most likely, unless it's, unless it's specified as PX, it's usually Oloroso. Typically, but again, Dr. Rachel Berry and with our brand, brand with our brands tends to be the number one purchaser Pedro Menes cast. So there's always some very exciting ones out there. And we definitely have some Pedro Menes casts in our warehouse. Again, some of those single casts I mentioned have some of those offerings as well. But this definitely yeah. has old Rosso, and then the ex bourbon in here as well, which with Brown Foreman being the only American whiskey that actually a uh, company that has their own cooperages, we are able mm. to source those specifically. I believe Heaven Hill does as well. Do they really have their own cooperage? I believe so, yeah. Okay. Well, then that's great. But we also have the cooperages at uh, Old Forester and Jack Daniels as well. Yes. Um, so Brown Foreman to has two cooperages, Old Forester and Jack Daniels cooperages. 
Uh, but I believe Heaven Hill has one as well. Okay, great. It's awesome. I have to make a note of that. <laughs> more you know. Exactly. I feel like we can have like those little rainbow things, like the more you know. <laughs> have it be your new logo. Oh God, no. <laughs> Please no. I I got enough. I had a hard enough time picking up the logo I currently have and getting that design. That took a lot of like back and forth. And I get enough shit for it being very dark. And like I used to have this like intro video I'd play with like very dark, ominous music. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, hey, what's going on? I'm like happy and excited. And I was like, those are two very stark contrasts. Pick one. <laughs> like, but I, I like the dark grungy kind of music. It it's my per it's my style. Like I obviously I'm wearing a black polo shirt against a black background even. <laughs> so black and darker are kind of what I wear mostly. Um so forty six percent ABV. Forty six percent. I'm assuming okay, it is non chill filtered. Yep, so all of these are non chill filtered and uh, no color added. So looking at the color difference here between the evolution and the revival, we really see that cast different. We'll go to the evolution next to see why that was such a different color. But that revival, all that cherry and all that red wine just imparts this beautiful, rich, almost ruby brown type color that's just really lovely. So I want to know. Is there any word, any talk of dropping the non shield filtered label from Glenglossa and from Ben Rea like they did with Glendronic? Now, obviously, before you answer that question, I've been a stark defender of Glendronic and their dropping of the chill filter of the non shield filter label. After talking to you and talking to Rory and both of you doing a little bit of digging for me to find out that it's only maybe to two negative two, negative three degrees Celsius versus negative 10, which is proper to filtration, only to get rid of some of the flocculate, which just so, makes for inconsistent looking bottling. So so yeah, the non-chill filter issue obviously is something that we've been known for and how we've made our whiskeys for a long period of time. Um, you know, as we kind of talked about, they did take the non-chill filter off the label of both both Benriac and Glendronic. But now, you do Benriac too? It did, so with the new relaunch, it's not on there either. Wow, um, wow, I didn't even know that, holy. No one's talking about that. But but again, uh, it's something where to actually define what is chill filtered and non-chill filtered, there's not any sort of very strict guideline when it comes to chill filtered. It's not saying you have to chill it down between this and this, right? Um, Correct. Usually when you drop the temperature uh, by varying degrees at all, it tends to have to have that off the label just by definition alone. Um, and again, this is not something we're now massively we're adding color, we're gonna be doing anything like that. This was simply to try to help with the fluctuation that we were having with the flocculation. That sounds like a, a new song I should come out with, the fluctuation with the flocculation. Uh, which- Don't again, tell me you're one of those LA residents is a musician or an actor too. No, I don't have I don't have the, uh, the tough skin for it. I, I don't handle rejection well. I couldn't make it in the town if I were an actress or a musician. Uh, I'd rather just- stick no, I couldn't to do it either. Yeah, so again, at this time, I'm not sure if they're taking the non chill filter off the label of Gungas out as well. Um, that information will probably be passed along in the future to us if and when that happens. And if and when it happens, it will be in the same vein uh, as we've done with the others, which is again, not to just all of a sudden do this long cooling pipe of chill filtration, but rather just to allow the flexibility for our master tasters, master blenders to be able to bottle it where they see is the best balance. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I, I've been, uh, I'm getting mad actually recently at people talking nonsense about, you know, these whiskeys because I like Glenglassa. I love Glendronic and Ben Riek. So those two are kind of close to my heart. And to hear all this, quite frankly, all these fucking morons who don't know shit, not even sorry. Uh, all the people who think they know something, but they actually don't, and they're uneducated and d didn't do the damn research on it, it drives me up the wall. I mean, what I do love about these whiskeys, too, is, you know, obviously people who are very passionate about single malts gravitate towards them, which is a huge honor and is a little bit of a great point about how great our whiskeys are and have been 
and the history behind them. Uh, it also means that people are very passionate about how they feel about it and with their opinions on it. And that's going to happen when you have such this loyal fan base, right? Uh, but Absolutely. What, I also, what I also love about, for example, Gungasa that we're tasting now, again, still very small made. Um, in fact, the only computer we really have at the distillery is to uh, control the water temperature. That's the only thing you have. Did you know that the Brooklady distillery doesn't have computers? I, I know they're one of a couple that do not have computers, um, which honestly is great. I mean, I just thought it was a really cool fact. You mentioned, you know, you only have like one computer in the distillery. I thought it was a really cool little tidbit. Oh, absolutely. Um, and a lot of, and our other two distilleries too are very traditional. Um, you know, with Bundronic, the only new equipment they've had really was how they heat stills because having an open flame doesn't really cut it anymore in a distillery. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a little hard to control too. Yes, exactly. So, you know, with Glenglasso, I love it because it is so unique. So it does really speak to those mm -hmm. very passionate single malt drinkers, but it also speaks to a whole new demographic of people who want to get into single malt. And that brings me to the evolution. So we call- I am loving this evolution. Oh, the evolution is lovely. So we're, we call this the revival because it was the first release of this reawakened distillery, right? It's the reviving now, of this. If you don't job. mind, Rachel, real quick, yeah. before we jump into the evolution, um, talk to us about the logo of Glen Glassa. Sure. So this is kind of an older uh, sort of press that's been around with the distillery for a while. So you can see the still right in the center there. And then you can see the two, I, I'm forgetting their name, but there's uh, a type of seabird that you can see in uh, Sandan Bay that makes it frequently there. And then you have the barley at the very bottom. And permare preteras. You know, I actually don't know what that means. So I need to look that up. I'm pretty sure I knew it back in the past, but I have not even looked at it in a while. So what kind of barley are you guys using? So we are using um, a few different sources. Again, we have a lot of those amazing barley fields next to us. But again, 100% malted barley being a single malt scotch. Well, um, yeah, but I mean, are you using two-row barley? Are you using six-row barley? Is it Golden Promise? Is it some kind of other barley varietal? I mean, honestly, I, it, I, I'm i not sure what they're currently using. They have in the past used the barley from the barley fields that were close by. Currently, I know that they've been working with a few other local farmers. What exactly that is, I can look it up for you and send that to you. Okay. Mm. Are you on the evolution? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So even the nose on this, and if you go back and forth through revival, mm. then the revival for me now that I'm nosing the evolution smells so sweet, almost like that amazing confection of sugar with like like angel's food cake almost with those strawberries and that revival. The but revival now, is wicked sweet. The evolution is just so savory. Exactly. So I'm getting a ton of that sea salt I mentioned that's going to be present throughout everything. It's a little more present here. I'm getting a little bit of citrus as well. Some hay, like some earthiness to it. Mm. Now, uh, you're not doing your own maltings, right? No, not currently. So I'm assuming it's either kiln or steam dried, not peat dried kiln. barley. We're, yeah, we're dried. Doing okay. steam dried, yes. Now on the palate with this one, Mm. So this is a bit of higher proof. This is 50 percent now. Oh, it is. Uh, even on Fun. the, isn't it? No wonder I like it more. Well, even on the nose with this, it does not. No, it has such a delicate nose to it for being fifty percent. And on the palate, you get I get a little bit of that, like you mentioned before, savoriness, that salinity, but it really highlights these honeysuckle notes. This amazing vanilla. A lot of those orchard fruits really coming out here too. Some pear, some of that. I get banana. Banana for sure. So that's actually a great note because this is aged in 100% Tennessee whiskey barrels. Oh, wow. Okay. So and banana. I'm assuming they're Jack barrels then, yes, because of the brown forming relationship ownership. That does help, right? Yes. So you're, that banana note that is clearly found in Tennessee whiskey, it's clearly found in Jack. Great pickup here because that's definitely coming from there. And it's again, not just banana though, it's banana Laffy Taffy. 
So a little bit of that, again, sort of um, saltwater taffy for me too with this. Totally. Again, talking about, again, totally. difference on here. It's almost transporting me back to San Francisco. It's, so it's that coastal influence, that, that atmosphere. What I love about these whiskeys is you really just get a sense of where they come from. Kind of transports you to that amazing sort of green, gray, Scottish coastal seaside. So even though we're not sort of having a that barley or anything else that's like that coastal isla influence, we are getting that amazing sea breeze that comes through our dunnages. So we are, when we're aging these whiskeys and these wood casts, you get some of that crisp sea air coming in and influencing everything about this distillery from start to finish. Now the fruitiness that comes on here too, not only from those Tennessee uh, whiskey barrels, but also, as I mentioned, we have a very high mineral content to the water we're using for this, which is going to add a lot of that fruitiness to this as well. So you're aging your whiskey uh, in port soy? Yes. Well, okay, right, know where the is, right where the distillery is located. We have warehouses right there. Underground. Okay, I know a lot of distilleries send the whiskey inland to like Edinburgh. No, we have out there. We age it right where our distillery is, which again, accounts for that sea air coming through the dunnages. That's really adding that character. And again, I mentioned that uh, the robbery that thank God they didn't take any of the whiskey in that case, because um, we've been sitting on some great ones in there. What's the best one you've tried so far? Working with Glenglasa, obviously, I'm sure you've gotten to try oh, some fun things. Gosh, it's so hard. I mean, Glenglasa, you see this big jump, right, of these amazing, Again, for being as young as they are, having this amazing character with these non-age statement whiskeys, but then you get a jump to a 30 year, right? Because we did have that 20 year gap of not producing anything. So we're having a, this whole gap between releasing a 30 and 40 year that just came out this year, and then a 50 year that's coming out as well, which is very exciting. Um, not gonna be readily available, because again, very small production. Uh, so it's gonna yeah, be- Yeah, I doubt I'll even get a media <laughs> sample of that. <laughs> I mean, hey, if, if you get it, you have to share it with me because it's so amazing. It's like a little bit of liquid gold in that. Um, so you have- What about Rory? He gets like the little like, he gets the, uh, like the, what you call it? Um, fuck, there's a word for it. It's like the end of something. Like, I think it's a D, it begins with a D. Well, it really just depends, honestly, on how much is produced. With something like a 50-year, <laughs> there's not going to be much that yielded from these. No, there's not going to be much that's yielded. And like I said, I doubt I'll get a media sample. But, you know, <laughs> knock on wood that our friends over at the PR agency would like us enough to send us a little sample. Um, but, I mean, so I've tasted some phenomenal whiskeys with them. The 30-year alone is is outstanding. Uh but again, those single casks I mentioned before, I've been able to taste one that's a port cask, and I've tasted another one that was a peated uh, Oroso cask. That was phenomenal as well. So, oh my really, God, I need that in my life. Similar with Ben Riach, where you have this amazing warehouse full of very eclectic casks. You know, Gungasso also had quite a bit of collection in those warehouses for so long. So there's really something always exciting coming down the pipeline with these whiskeys. Being a reawakened whiskey really lets you kind of carve out new paths and do some very exciting things. Everything you said after that is, I mean, all due respect, is great. But all I'm thinking about right now is that peated Oloroso cask <laughs> because I need like a bottle of that in my life. It's all I can think about for the next couple minutes. Yep, it's okay. You can rewind it and hear what I said later. <laughs> Pardon? No, nothing. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> I was saying I didn't hear what you said, so it's not effective teasing. <laughs> well, but talking about innovative things and Pete, that kind of brings us to the next whiskey. Well, let's not get to it yet. I want to enjoy the evolution yep. a little more. Again, a very unique single malt. We have two hours to go through all of this. <laughs> I get very excited talking about whiskey. Uh, hi, sorry. Have you met me? <laughs> You were just at my bar yesterday. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you guys had some great whiskeys there, for sure. Some great older whiskeys that you can't find anymore. Yes. Actually, when I went to look for your Ben Riek 17-year uh, Chieftains, I found a 30. 
I, I did see that. So trust me, I'm definitely gonna be coming back and trying some of the older expressions <laughs> that have almost been lost to time. So yes, well, we have some very fun things. Um, I showed you that Ben Riek ten year heart of space side. Yep, which is a fantastic one. Yeah, which is also we have to do a Ben Riek episode. We were talking about that, remember? Yeah, I have a bottle up myself. Yeah, we have some amazing Heart of Space sides that are laying around for sure. Yeah, if you can find a bottle of it, guys, uh, jumping over to a sister brand real quick, Ben Riek, um, before the current bottling, which is the hipster bottling, I'm going to call it, two bottling iterations ago, so not the last one, but the one before that, was the Heart of Space side bottlings. And those are discontinued. They're early 2000s. You can find them apparently. They're really, really good, non chill filtered. Um, I found one at a random store in San Diego when I went to go buy a Smirnoff Ice to punk a friend. Can I tell you that's what I found? That I was in San Diego around December, driving to pick up some bottles of whiskey from a friend of mine. Um, and I stopped off at a random liquor store to grab a Smirnoff Ice and drove up to South Orange County and then dropped off or came to see a friend of mine uh to give him a birthday christmas gift kind of deal and uh first i gave him i left the bag i stepped back because of covid so i put back i stepped back and he's like hey what's up i'm like i pointed to the bag he's like oh what's this i just pointed to the bag he opened it and he's like oh i hate you he was a a large one yeah so I made him finish the whole damn thing before giving him his gift. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, Ben Riek's fantastic. And we'll do a Ben Riek episode. Uh, God, I just can't get over how good this evolution is. The revival was nice, but I think the evolution is my new favorite. Honestly, I go back and forth. It really depends on my mood. These are so unique to each other. You know, the, the evolution is so... Again, for being 50%, it's just so easy to drink. And especially on a hot summer day like this, you know, it's very light. It's refreshing. It would go great in a penicillin. It would, or even a highball with this, too. I've done a highball um, with this with a little bit of uh, anything with honey with this, too, goes really well. That honey and the honeysuckle with that amazing I sort of can't do highballs, but then again, most of the highballs I've had are just spirit and soda water. Yeah. And it just ruins the whiskey for me. It just really depends, honestly. I, for me, a highball can be really refreshing, especially if the proportions are right, because you still get all the attributes of that. And look, we can also get into the debate right now about how you should drink your whiskey, should add water or not. Um, there's some no people, debate. The answer is there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. It's however you want to drink it. Exactly. Um, and I will say, too, there is something to be said about adding a drop of water to glass out, because I usually don't, add a drop of water to anything that's lower than a than cast strength. I usually don't add a drop of water to, you know, anything really young or anything like that. But if you add a drop of water to these whiskeys, because of that really unique raw spirit that we have, it's going to unlock so many different sort of flavors. This is one where I've never seen a whiskey transform so much with just a single drop of water. Um, so I'm actually going to go ahead and do that now with both Revival and Evolution. I have a little bit of water right here. Yeah. So I have a little so, angle for that I can use. And I only do a couple drops, but again, I, just like you said, Sam, you should drink your whiskey how you like to drink it. You know, I've had some people say, blast me to put a drop of water in. I've had some people say, never put over ice. At the end of the day, you're the one who's buying it. You're the one who's drinking it. You should drink it how you like it. I don't. Well, I added about a quarter ounce of water to this just now. Okay. I just did a couple drops, but again, it, watch how it transforms. Um, also, shout out to Karen Somerville of Angel Share Glass. I know you mentioned you have an Angel Share dropper. Um, do you want to show that up for the camera people to see? Sure. Hand blown. Uh, whiskey water dropper pipette straight from Scotland. Uh, support a small business, you guys, if you have the funds and you're available or able to. Karen's a really sweet lady. 
and she would love the support. It's really a beautiful piece of, of artwork. I don't know how yeah, to it's hand blown it. crystal, I believe, or hand blown glass. Yeah, it's it's really phenomenally like well done. Um mm. Mm -hmm. isn't, which one are you doing now? The evolution or the mm -hmm. isn't it so unique now? So again, we talked about the amazing caramel toffee sweetness. This unlocked it. all the earthiness and the pineapple. The tropical fruit that comes out with the drop of water is so transformative. So I mentioned, remember I told you the strawberry on the nose and the ripe fruits and the pineapple. It was present on the nose, but not as much on the palate, but with a couple drops of water with it. Okay, so this is gonna be weird, but hear me out. I get baked goods, just general, you know, bakery vibes. Absolutely, I could totally see that. You said baked goods, right? So similar to like baking spices and things of that nature? Not so much baking spices is like, baked dough or like muffins or like croissant or whatever something along those lines something you know like again back to the fluffy uh-huh almost like pineapple upside down cake kind of thing or like a sponge cake yes with that caramel drizzle the tropical fruit again there is a beautiful sort of that sweeter cereal malt going also on also a that. tres leches cake definitely a tres leches cake that you know like Slight vanilla with the caramel and the sponge. But again, this is at a high enough proof where it doesn't it doesn't become too sweet for me. Like you get all the amazing notes of that type of dessert, but the finish on I it started, is so clean. Speaking of high proof, you know, not being too sweet. Talking about cocktails earlier. I've started to mix with higher proof spirit. Instead of going something like 40, 42, mm -hmm. I'm going 50 and above oftentimes, you know. Yeah. Or at least, you know, like 46, 92 proof. So that it stands up better, so it's not going to be so diluted. I mean, and that definitely, you get more of the whiskey characteristic when you do something like that. And again, we talked about how some people are very much against that type of thing. I think as we get to the Torfa, it makes a mean penicillin. It makes a mean, a mean spirit in any sort of uh, cocktail. Because it if you look back on my channel, Rachel, after we finish chatting... You'll see I did a whole 30 days of cocktails with, for the most part, very nice whiskey. Mm -hmm. I made a cocktail with a 30th anniversary bourbon that goes for like two to three bucks a bottle now. How was it? Intentionally to piss off the internet. <laughs> and did you get any feedback? No, sadly. <laughs> Oh, I did have one of my viewers is like, please stop making cocktails with these whis this whiskeys. I don't like you making cocktails with these whiskeys. Please go back <laughs> to just talking about the whiskeys and eat. And I said respectfully, I'm like, hey, you know, I appreciate your opinion and your feedback, but this whole series is 30 days of cocktails. <laughs> Shows the versatility of the whiskey. But going back to that revival with that drop of water. And also, mm -hmm. it's opening up more too. So you kind of find this with those. Uh, whiskeys that are heavier influenced with like any sort of wine or sherry or port, they tend to open up more the more they've been in the Glen Karen as well. And it's going to unlock more of that, but definitely it really is just such a beautiful single malt to, to play around with, you know, becoming your own master specifically it just unlocks so many different things. This is one that I, it keeps transforming. And again, every time I nose or taste a Glen Glassau, I always pick up something different. Well, who wanted to talk for them? So, you were talking about peat earlier. Yes. Let's talk about a peated Highland now. Yeah. So, a Highland peat, again, not something you see very often. Uh, peat is known for being those Isla Scotches, like Ardbeg, Lefroig, uh, Lagavulin, some amazing whiskeys that use that very distinctive peat. Um, but now what we're finding is that peat doesn't just have to be from those regions. So obviously, you know, you mentioned Ben Riach and they're peated in the past. That's something that they are side using this peat that's very unique. Now here's Glen Glassau also using that very distinct Highland peat. So we're not sourcing it from Isla. We're not getting any of that coastal matter in that peat. For those that don't know, Peat is essentially like fossilized soil, fossilized earth and debris matter. You can carve it out in these bogs. Um, 
And whatever was growing there at the time is going to be present in that peat. So when you're sourcing it from Highland, instead of getting all of that algae and sea matter, you're getting more of this sort of foresty type plant material. So it's going to be more of a barbecue smoke versus that very distinct Isla smoke. Our master blender, Dr. Rachel Berry, affectionately calls it the seagull's armpit smell, which she's allowed <laughs> to say because she worked on our bed for a time. Um, and it's beautiful in its own right. But even here, it's almost like a campfire. So, so we mentioned her name a bunch of times today. Yes. Let's talk about Dr. Barry now. So Dr. Rachel Barry, who obviously is amazing, um, not just because we both have the same first name, Rachel, but because she is pretty much, <laughs> she's pretty much the first lady of scotch. Uh, so she's in the Whiskey Hall of Fame. She's considered the first female master blender uh, in whiskey. She's been doing this for about 30 years now. Um, she really is just a rock star, and she's worked on some of the biggest names in the industry. You know, Bullmore, Arctantashen, uh, Glamorangi, Ardbeg, all of these have been part of her legacy. And so her now coming to Brown Foreman and overseeing R3 distilleries is almost like a homecoming for her. You know, these are smaller brands that she really gets to put her name on. Glendronic is actually near where she grew up as a little girl, where she was able to ride her bike and pick the berries that grew in that valley. Glenglassau, is actually where her grandparents had a family home that she would go visit as a child. So a lot of this has an emotional connection to her. Not only, you know, is it just whiskey, it's it's more than that. And even looking and nosing and smelling these spirits, you feel it. You feel that warmth and you feel that vibrancy in there. And with the torf in there, I my torfa. <laughs> so she really, more. she really is just a rock star in this um but going now, back we keep calling her dr rachel berry but she's not technically a doctor she's an honorary doctorate can you tell us a little bit about her you know any more about that because i don't know much about it yeah no absolutely so you know she actually first started in whiskey when she was uh sort of in uni and rode past the distillery and thought they were hiring and it kind of let her realize that she could combine the two things she loved the most which was science and whiskey together um, so she does have an honorary doctorate from the University of Edinburgh for her work. She has a doctorate, so she is a doctor. Oh, she actually has a doctorate. I didn't know that. Well, well it's an honorary doctorate, but that's still, you know, like she, she is considered, you know, um, a doctor, especially in this chemical engineering, uh, chemical sciences that she does. So what I love about how she talks about whiskey is it is science meets art. You know, she, the way Absolutely. she describes it, it's so romantic to hear her speak about whiskey. Now I've, you know, living in Los Angeles, encountered a few celebrities through bartending in my day, but I've never been starstruck around anybody the same way I was starstruck around Dr. Rachel Berry. Hearing her speak about the craft and about this industry is just so inspiring. You know, she talks about her process in, in a couple ways, one being like an orchestra where she, you know, conducts the strings and the, uh, uh, the wind instruments and the percussions all together with the different barrels, which we found in the revival. You know, there's three different distinct barrels that she very masterfully decided to meld together in a way that produced this amazing, unique product, right? Absolutely. She also talks, she also talks about it similar to like painting, right? So you're, you're getting different colors and pigments in there and painting all the, using these individual pigments to create this really beautiful landscape. And she does that not just with the cast that she knows and tastes every year, but she also does that with the peat quality, which we find here, a very unique ingredient to a Highland distillery. So again, that Highland peat is so unique here. But what sets, sets this apart from a distillery like Glen, uh, Ben Rioch, which uses that same type of Highland peat, but in a different way, we're again, getting that coastal influence. So this is going to be ex-bourbon, ex-sherry casks. And even on the nose here, you get that amazing campfire, but getting some vanilla in there, getting some nuttiness as well. That fruit that I mentioned that is really, really distinct for us and that sweetness that comes from using that high minerality for our water. And this is also 50%. So another, I catch that, yeah. another example of having a delicate nose for something that's higher proof. But then on the palate, this is really unique as well. 
the palate is very different. It's earthy. It's very mineral heavy. Mm. It's kind it's, of chocolatey even a little bit. I definitely get chocolate. I definitely get citrus. Um, and I still get that sweetness coming out here as well. Again, using the sherry cast, but also having that raw spirit that tends to be a little bit sweeter. But you're right. It has an earthiness to it. So Torfa is actually uh, Gaelic for peat or earth. So that is a very fitting name for it, a fitting description for this as well. Uh, but again, a different type of peat. So not that distinct Isla peat. This is going to be more of that smoky campfire. But again, that sea salt that I mentioned that runs very clearly through all three really comes out here as well. It's again, that really beautiful balance and weaving in of all of these flavors. So when we actually peat the barley over these kilns, you're getting that amazing Sandan Bay coastal air coming through. You're getting the splashing of the waves nearby and the air picking up that sea salt and coming through as we peat. So you're picking up all of that salinity in that beginning so, process. Rachel, talk to me about the, this, the process of making these whiskeys, because if you're not doing your own malting, where are you getting the peated barley from? Are you peating it yourself? Or how is that working with the Torfa? Are you buying peated barley? So we are doing a little bit of both. You know, but that's the easiest way to answer that question. You know, we are sourcing some, we do occasional runs of, of some uh, peated peat as well, but we are doing a little bit of both. Um, but when we do it ourselves, you definitely pick up that salinity there through that process. You know, again, and the knowledge of the Torfa is a blend of the two. I'm assuming it's a blend of, you know, casks that you guys peated yourself versus casks that you purchased the peated malt from or rather for. Yeah. So, so again, I can't say specifically the proportions that are there because that information is not, is very proprietary. Um, but I can say that there is 10, there tends to be a balance there. Um, I had to guess it's probably honestly I don't even feel comfortable guessing because I, I would not be able to speak to actually how much that is with the breakdown of it. Um, so how many casts are we looking at per batch per run? You know it really depends. So we're doing here an example of X bourbon and we're doing an example of uh, cherry. So depending on we, we source different types of cherries in different sizes. We have some hogsheads, we have some punchins, some butts. So when Dr. Ishveri goes through and she knows and tastes all these casks, sometimes a puncheon is going to be what she uses for the torfa. Sometimes it's going to be what she uses for revival. Sometimes she's going to do some cherry butts or some hogsheads, or sometimes she'll put those as single cast. So it does vary in how how many casks we use in one bottle, just based on the pure variation of size with all the sherry casks. Okay. You know, because the hogshead yields a little bit more, almost as much as like an American bourbon barrel, so an ex bourbon barrel, but then you have punchins that yield about, you know, five times that much. Right. So it really depends. And again, it's going to give you a different flavor. So when you're having something like a hogshead, you have more wood to liquid contact, which means you're going to pick up a little bit more of that wood influence. When you have something like a punchin or a butt, you have a little bit less of that wood to liquid contact, which means that you're going to pick up a little bit less of that flavor. So it really just depends on temperature, on the year, how long it's been in that cast, or what makes it balanced. Part of honestly what's so amazing about what Dr. Rachel Berry does, because it's not just about finding some amazing cast that will fit into an amazing bottle. It's about making it consistent with all the variations that happen with casts. You know, it's what she spends the most right, time. Right, it's about making the consistency. It's about blending it for consistency. Exactly. So again, if that means this time I'm using a punch-in, whereas next time in the punch-in's not enough, I need to do a butt. It, it, there's so much variation that can happen in that. And that's part of the master craft that what she does is figuring out each year exactly what uh, works best. Gotcha. No, it's fascinating. You know, I have a lot of respect for someone like Dr. Barry. Uh, just off of her stellar work, but also, you know, being a very well-respected, very powerful powerhouse woman in whiskey, um, obviously, you know, that is, how do I put this without, with make, so it makes any sense. I respect Dr. Barry for her work and her craft, 
first and foremost, above anything else. To me, she is a whiskey blender who just happens to be a woman, if you know what I'm saying. Like, the fact, I don't know, I feel like I'm digging a grave for myself here when I'm trying to be complimentary. She she is a master whiskey blender. She is a keeper of the quake. She's in the Whiskey Hall of Fame. She happens to also be a woman. She yes, is thank you. Exactly. Who, who really has changed the industry for the better? You know. Um, oh, one hundred percent. Being a female in this in this industry can be very challenging. You know, it's not. It was not something that was as open for women to really enter this realm for a long time. And she's been doing it much longer than it's been the norm to have you and I have this conversation, right? So she really has yeah. opened up doors for people, but she's done that because of her pure skill and because of her pure artistry and exactly just being fantastic at what she does. You know, she's an award-winning master blender for a reason. You can taste it. You can feel it when you drink her whiskeys. Um, they're unlike any other whiskeys you can find out there. There is such this emotional sort of beautiful expression that comes out of all of these uh the unique cast mixing that she does the again using different highland peats using all of these different techniques that are innovative but also very traditional or, or such a, it's such a skill set you know and i'm really in awe of just everything that are in these bottles that she's done absolutely no they're fantastic bottles they're delicate and balanced zippers they would go really well in a cocktail, and you know I might try that out a little bit later. Um, I don't really have anything else to talk about. I mean, to be honest, sometimes the best thing about whiskey is just being able to sit and drink it quietly next to somebody. That's how you know it's a good whiskey when you're sitting there absorbed in it. You know, one of the yeah. pleasures I had was uh, going into the bar last night to meet you and, and talk about doing this today. And meeting the two gentlemen I sat next to who love single malt but never heard of these before and being able to taste them on it and just being able to sit there and appreciate them in a couple moments of silence, you know, and, and I am still it. laughing that I found the Glendronic after you left. Okay, we'll get them next time. But uh They bought it anyway, actually. See? Oh, there we go. Um that's actually completions. I, I, I that was the last of the bottle too. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just such an honor to be able to sit here and enjoy whiskey, right? Like, I think if, if absolutely it taught us anything, it's the fact that being able to sit back and enjoy whiskeys with somebody that you know or have never met before is part of this, part of this, you know? Whiskey's meant to be shared. It's meant to be enjoyed with other people. It's a great way to meet new people. It's a great way to find common interests. Like, whiskey really is a absolutely. great Absolutely. You know, on that note, just going to give a shout out to David Donahue from the Los Angeles Whiskey and Spirits Guild. He's tuning in and watching us as we're chatting and just rambling away. And I met David actually just before COVID in February oh, nice. 2020 at a whiskey dinner in Hollywood. Amazing. Those are coming back now finally, which is great. Yes, I'm very excited. You know, I can't wait to attend some and host some and do both. <laughs> well, Rachel, I think we're just gonna cut it an hour today because I've exhausted all my conversation topics. You are so precise and swift with your answers that you just, you answered all my questions. I hope so. Well, obviously, if anyone has any more questions, you can find me on Instagram at Drams with Rachel. Um, Let me throw that up for the people. Of course. And yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. If I don't know the answer, I definitely know people who would. So I can definitely reach out. But it is such an honor to be able to connect with you and be able to talk about the glass out, which is, again, such a great lesser known whiskey that I'm excited more people are discovering. It's a fantastic whiskey. And speaking of sherry casks and sherry, uh, well, next week is actually even more special than that. Um, Next week, I'm all things going according to plan. I will be live in person at the brand new distillery in Las Vegas for Lost Spirits. Nice. The following week, the 27th, I have a well respected sommelier 
uh, master of his craft, certified sherry wine specialist, and the the sommelier for Lustau for America, Lucas Paya, coming on to talk sherry with me. So I'm very excited to talk about sherry. Not sherry cast whiskey, just straight up sherry. That one's going to be a lot of fun. So, ladies and gentlemen, Rachel, thank you for joining us. And, y'all, you know, we will see you next week, if everything goes according to plan, live from Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Cheers, launch, and we'll talk to you next time.